This is lecture 13 on religion. In this lecture, we'll talk about the difference between religion and magic. We'll talk about uh, those who, uh, who are religious practitioners. Um, so let's start by looking at religion from three different sociologists and anthropologists and their theories on religion. Uh, the French sociologist Emile uh, Durkheim believed that religion enabled people to transcend their individual identities to see themselves as a larger part of a larger collective. Very good way to think of religion. But another way to think about religion was uh, thought about by Marx, uh, Max Weber. He believed that religion and economic institutions uh, arised hand in hand. Um, his idea was uh, strengthened by an example of the Protestant faith, which led to the support and the rise of capitalism in Western societies. Um, looking at religion and uh, freedom, uh, Protestant uh, European Protestants who immigrated to the United States, um, with that uh, leaving uh, Europe, they were allowed to engage in economic institutions um, that were preventative when they were living in Europe, uh, only the uh, the royalty were allowed to engage in business and uh, the elites of the society en enabled um, uh, economic growth. But the freedom of practicing re the religion and also engaging in economic institutions may have led to the rise of capitalism and, they, and Max Weber believed that there was a relationship between religion and economic institutions. The third uh, theorist that we're going to think about is Karl Marx and his idea of religion. Um, <clears throat> Karl Marx had a non-ethnological perspective that linked organized religions with social inequality uh, by suggesting that religion was a, a tool for oppressing the lower classes. Marx believed that religion was the opiate of the masses. So from all three different perspectives, Durkheim, who was a sociologist, Weber, who was an economist, and Mar uh, Karl Marx, who looked at the difference between religion and uh, suppressing uh, other members of society, we have three different interpretations of what religion uh, is and what religion does. For our class, <clears throat> we're going to define religion as a set of rituals that are rationalized by myth, that mobilize supernatural powers to achieve or prevent transformations of state and people and nature. Religion is the beliefs and patterns of behavior by which people try to control aspects of the universe that are otherwise beyond their control. Um, <clears throat> amongst food foraging um, groups, smaller groups, food foraging um, nomadic societies, um, members believe that they're part of the world, not masters of it. Um, in Western civilization, there's a difference between nomadic food foraging groups and now Western civilizations where we have an ideological commitment to overcome problems through technology and organized skill. Um, <clears throat> we see the difference between um, religion in smaller groups and larger groups. And uh, when we look at our own society, we're placing more emphasis on science uh, and moving away from religious institutions, although we'll talk about that more uh, a little later. In the history of religion, in the 19th century, the European intellectual uh, rise, uh, this intellectual tradition rose to the idea that science would ultimately destroy religion by showing people that the rationality of their myths and religions were untrue. Um, but when we think about today and modern religion, we see a fundamental um, fundalist, fundamentalist movement where there's a strong resurgence in uh, religion. Um, we can see that in Afghanistan and Iran. We can see that in uh, Israel. Uh, we can see that with the Hindu religion in India. And we can see that evangelist, uh, evangelistic Christian groups are dominating uh, certain areas, especially Latin America. <clears throat> Uh, so there is a rise in a resurgence in religion. In fact, if we look at the numbers, in the United States there's over 16, uh, sorry, 1,600 religions, 800 of which were founded after 1965. When we think about our country and the religions that constitute our country, um, based on censuses, there's 1,600 religions in our society, 
800 of those were founded after 1965. The growing number um, of religious uh, groups and their numbers in um, the country include, there are over 3.5 million Muslims in the United States, and that number is comparable to the number of Presbyterians in our society. Uh, and that number is rising every year. Buddhists in the United States constitute 750,000, but again, that number is rising, as well as Hindus. Hindus constitute about 80, 800,000, but again, when these figures came out, that number may now well exceed over a million. So, in our society, the growing number of people who are religious and the growing number of religions, there's a resurgence of those who practice religion and then those numbers. Um, in the history of religion, we look at maybe some of the earliest evidence that religion existed maybe 200,000, 300,000 years ago, and this is reflected in Paleolithic art, uh, wall paintings, and in carved uh, bone objects, artifacts. Um, some of the problems of defining religion falls within some societies. Religion is thoroughly embedded in the total social structure that often it's difficult to distinguish the religious um, from economic, political, and kinship behavior. Uh, for example, let's give you an example how religion may be integrated and difficult to uh, observe. The Kikuu, um, the elder members of the Kikuu will sacrifice a goat at the grave of an ancestral god. So you have a number of different behavior going on here. Not, you have an elder sacrificing a goat at the grave of an ancestral god. Here's the religious behavior. By sacrificing the goat, you are calling for the ancestral god to intervene in the affairs of the living. This is the religious behavior. Uh, the economic behavior is that the meat of the sacrificed animal will be distributed and eaten amongst all the members of that kinship group. So now you have the economic wealth of that goat being distributed and shared amongst all the members of that kinship group and that household. We see the kinship behavior that through sacrificing and through this ritual of sacrificing the goat to the gods, this is the chance for the members of the group to show their solidarity at a ceremonial event. So not only do you have a religious aspect, the sacrifice of the goat, but you have the economic and kinship that are integrated as well. And it's very difficult to determine what is what. Um, but anthropologists study this. Um, in religion, there's a dichotomy between reason and science. Um, uh, there's, in religion, there's no dichotomy between natural and supernatural, right? Um, we're trying to define what religion is. I'm going to give you another example. Uh, the Nayaro of Uganda. The Nayaro of Uganda have a word for sorcery that means to injure another person by a secret use of harmful medicines or techniques. All right. What they'll do is they'll, um, they'll take a piece of hair or fingernail and they'll put that from another person. They'll put that in an animal horn, and putting that animal horn above the roof of a person's house, their intention is to cause that person harm, and this is an act of sorcery. Um, <clears throat> if you have a, there's a conflict or an issue, you might practice sorcery to harm another member of your society. Uh, in the Nayoro society, though, it is also common to put poison in the ear uh, or put poison in the enemy's food or drink, intentionally causing that person to be sick, which is also um, um, there's two things going on here. The Nairo are, if they're causing harm to one person, are actually physically poisoning another, but they believe that it's not the poisoning, it's the fingernail or hair that's above the door of this religious uh, uh, ritual that causes that person harm or injury. So in the religion we see the religious behavior, which is the practice, the ritual of putting uh, the contagious piece of material the, that has connection to that individual and causing um, conflict and, and pain. And then there's the, act, the actual physical science behind that, which is the poisoning of the individual. 
um, but they put more emphasis on the result from this religious practice of the, the horn and fingernail um, uh, displacement. So again, there's a very fine line between natural and supernatural in religion, but um, things can't have, be explained through reason and science, although from the scientific point of view, poison that person, there's going to be a, a cause and effect there. Right? Um, we have to define the difference between religion and magic at this point. Um, this will be the second part of your um, uh, lecture and will be in the video below. So, we're going to the second part of the video. The difference between religion and magic. Um, religion and magic, they share certain things. They share the belief in the supernatural and the non-rational. Um, those who practice religion and magic share a matter of faith that, um, uh, that exists uh, in their practice. Uh, religion and magic is practiced as a way of coping with anxieties, ambiguities, and frustrations of everyday life. But there is a difference between religion and magic. And there are five reasons um, why they differ. The fir um, let's first talk about religion. Religion deals with major issues of human existence, such as the meaning of life and death, and one's own spiritual relationship with deities, one or two. The belief in one god is called monotheism. The belief in many gods is called polytheism. Make sure you're aware of the definition between the two. Uh, however, magic is directed, this is the first um, difference between religion and magic, magic is directed towards specific immediate problems such as curing an illness, bringing on rain, or ensuing safety on a long journey. The second difference between religion and magic is that religion uses prayer and sacrifice to appeal or petition supernatural powers for assistance. In magic, Practitioners believe that they can control or manipulate nature or other people by their own efforts. All right? So in religion, calling upon deities for help. In magic, controlling and manipulating nature through their own efforts. That's the difference between the two. In re third reason, um, the third difference between religion and magic is religion, by, by and large, is, tends to be a group activity where magic is more individualistically oriented. The third, fourth difference between religion and magic is religion is practiced at a specific time where magic is practiced irregularly in response to specific and immediate problems. So the difference there is based on time. Um, one is uh, repetitive and consistent. The other only occurs when there is immediate problems. And finally, the fifth difference between religion and magic is that religion usually involves officially recognized functionaries such as priests. Magic may be performed by a wide variety of practitioners who may or may not recognize, or may or may not be recognized within their own community as having supernatural powers. Those are the differences between religion and magic, and you should be familiar with those differences. Uh, moving on and defining magic a little bit more, uh, your book talks about imitative and contagious magic. Well, imitative magic is based on the, prim uh, the principle of what you do is what you get. Haitian voodoo is an example of imitative magic. Uh, our definition, though, of magic, and before I get into contagious magic, magic involves the manipulation of supernatural forces for the purpose of intervening in a wide range of human activities and natural events. And imitative and contagious magics are the means to intervene in a wide range of human activities and, and natural events. We talked about imitative magic. Now let's talk a little bit about contagious magic. Contagious magic is the notion that an object that has been in contact with a person retains a magical connection to that person. We saw that uh, in our example with uh, groups in Uganda that... Um, cause harm to other members of their society by using a piece of fingernail or hair and placing that into a horn, putting that horn above the door uh, to cause that person physical harm. The idea is a type of contagious magic that the 
uh, power that's still in uh, uh, that person's uh, hair or in uh, a piece of skin uh, may still have some magical connection to that person. And by doing this ritual, it will cause them harm. It will turn um, their, that connection against them. Um, this kind of belief, uh, contagious magic, also is seen in our early colonial period in the United States. Early colonial households, the uh, family, when they built their house, would usually uh, cash underneath the door stoop or underneath the uh, fireplace a bottle, and in that bottle they may contain the fingernail or hair of some of their children, and that is to ward off or protect evil spirits from coming through the entryways of their houses. Uh, this was a belief that was brought over from Europe, and we see it uh, amongst early colonial uh, society members. Even uh, today, we still have different forms of imitative and contagious magic that you might see amongst uh, some of our members in society uh, having a uh, horseshoe over one's doorway um, uh, in the direction in which that horseshoe is pointing is also indicative of good or bad luck. This is a form of magical practice. Uh, in the United States, um, in 1200 of the 1750 daily newspapers, uh, we have these things called horoscopes. And what are horoscopes? Well, um, horoscopes tell you how your day is going to be based on your sign, your astrological sign. This, again, falls on the category of magic. Um, how the stars are aligned and your birth date influences your daily life. Um, in the United States, over two million Ouija boards have been sold as a form of entertainment, but also uh, these are, um, these are, this falls under the type of a form of magic. Um, elaborating on magic, um, those who practice magic um, have been, uh, deter uh, been denoted as uh, witches or uh, warlocks. Um, those who practice magic can be benevolent and they can be malevolent. They might have psychic powers. Um, those who belong to uh, a, a group of um, uh, those who practice magic have been denoted as belonging to covens. Uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, I believe there are a number of different covens that uh, include a number of practicing witches and again and warlocks, and they can be malevolent and benevolent. Uh, those who practice uh, magic, uh, we often use the term divination. Divination is the magical procedure for, deter uh, for uh, determining uh, and, de and uh, alleviating the case of a particular event such as an illness or fortune telling or foretelling the future. These are parts of divination. Divination is the magical procedure used by those who practice magic for resolving particular illnesses or for telling the future uh, futuristic events. Um, those who uh, practice, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, in our society, uh, we see uh, other various forms of magics, uh, magic that uh, might be difficult to recognize how that behavior came about. When you um, hope that something doesn't happen, you do what? Well, you knock on wood, right? That is a type of divination. You're knocking on something to prevent uh, something from happening. Um, when you open an umbrella inside the house, that will bring you bad luck. This, again, is a type of magic, different from religion. If you step on a crack, you, you break your mother's back. Again, if you don't step on a crack, then you won't cause um, something unfortunate to happen to another. These are all examples of things that fall under magic. All right. Moving on to our topic of religion, let's uh, define two other terms, animism and animatism. Animism is a belief in spirit beings thought to animate nature. Um, these uh, spirits are found in natural features such as springs, mountains, and rocks. 
Uh, those who practice animism see themselves as part of nature, uh, not masters of nature. Um, they don't believe that gods are they don't believe that gods are unimportant, but that spirits that are found in woods uh, and uh, natural objects are more important. Those who are uh, practitioners of animism, we use the term uh, shaman. Um, we'll go into greater detail about shaman a little later. Animatism is the belief that the world is animated by impersonal supernatural powers. Uh, the Melanesians use the term mana, and mana is a force that is inherited in all objects. It's, uh, it's not physical, but it can reveal itself physically. Uh, the Iroquois have the term orandata to describe mana. The Sioux, wakandona. Uh, the Algonquins, manitou. In the movie Star Wars, um, what was the physical uh, presence inherited in all objects? Well, that was called the force. So mana is the force inherent in all objects, not physical, but can reveal itself physically. And those who believe in animatism sometimes will wear amulets that have and contain um, mana or this, this force. Um, in the, uh, referring to pop culture, in Star Trek, uh, was that the metachlorians were found in humans, and this is a way to um, measure the amount of force in a person. Uh, in the, those who practice animatism will wear crystals or amulets that control and, and, and have, contain a lot of um, uh, this force. And it's a way to perfect and uh, um, protect those who um, wear them. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about religion, we have to talk about specialists. Uh, and religious, religious practitioners are often uh, described as priests or priestesses. Their job is to guide and supplement the religious practitioners of others. Um, those who are religious specialists, it's a full-time occupation. We have terms for these religious specialists, meaning priests, priestesses, rabbis, rectors, ministers. Um, uh, in Judaic, Christian, and Islamic um, religions, uh, there's an emphasis that, of masculinity and uh, supernatural beings, the God. Um, those who are practitioners, um, who are the specialists, have authoritarian terms. In those who are authorized full-time specialists are usually, in some cases, men. Uh, and they're important, uh, and the emphasis is on important religious positions. Uh, in those groups that are uh, that practice animatism and animism, the specialists are called shamans. And shamans are part-time specialists. They're religious specialists who have a unique power that is acquired through his or her initiative or intuition. Um, they might have the exceptional ability to deal with supernatural beings and powers that others in their society don't. Um, for example, I use the term, or the group, uh, the Maya. Uh, Maya shaman would uh, venture from communities into caves where they could communicate with their ancestors, with other Maya ancestors or ancestral spirits and gods. Um, the Maya shaman uh, had their special gifts for healing and divination. Um, the idea of going to a cave where it's dark um, were to induce a trance state. Uh, to induce a trance state, we use the anthropological definition of transvestism. You know that term? Transvestism, transvestism means to get into a trance state. To get into a trance state, a uh, shaman would either speak in a, an undecipherable language, they would uh, uh, go into a dark place and uh, go through light deprivation, and that causes hallucinogenic effects. They might lick uh, psychedelic, um, they might take psych psychedelic drugs, which would include toad licking. Um, they might uh, uh, in intentionally, ritualistically dance to bring on 
uh, uh, some type of exhaustion that could cause hallucinations. They may become sleep deprived by um, keeping themselves up at long periods of time. The reasons why they were doing this was to get into a trance state so that they can communicate with these supernatural beings. Now, um, in the case of uh, Maya shamans during the Maya um, classic period, uh, we know that the Maya shamans might be outcasts. They weren't particularly um, people in the society that were considered normal or uh, safe. They were dangerous. We have evidence at El Seren, a site in El Salvador that um, dates to the classic period that uh, a Maya shaman woman may have been imprisoned in her own home because they, the people in that community felt that she was dangerous. But she served a purpose because she could communicate with the ancestors and the dead. So having her around was important uh, for continual access to those who uh, overlooked the supernatural power be beings that overlooked the safety and welfare of the community. Um, so shaman, shamanists, shamans are part-time specialists that could be dangerous or outcasts. They serve a specific purpose because they're able to communicate with uh, the supernatural. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about in this uh, lecture is rituals. Uh, in religious um, and religious events, you may observe rituals. Uh, when we talk about rituals, we talk about rites of passage. Uh, and rites of passage are strictly religious in nature. They're ceremonies that mark a change in a person's social position. If you think about, if you're religious, you think about your uh, religion, you, some of you might have gone through some site of rite of passage that um, you were able to go from one position to another based on a ritual. Uh, examples being a baptism or a communion or a wedding uh, or funerary uh, rituals, you know, going from living to deceased. This is a rite of passage, right? What these rites of passages are are stages in the lives of individuals such as birth, marriage, and death, and that can be seen through baptism and communion or puberty. And they, uh, these rites of passage are the public recognition of your group that you've gone through a particular stage and now you're something else. Uh, the stages of a rite of passage, and your book dis discusses them in detail, is separation, transition, and incorporation. The first stage is separation, where you're physically removed from society. Uh, the first stage is separation. The next stage in the rites of passage is the transitional stage, where fo it follows isolation and is following separation and it's prior to incorporation. During this phase, uh, you're to undergo a ritual in which you are becoming more self-aware of your transition. Uh, you're self-reflective. Um, there might be some physical um, uh, energy required to make the transition or some psychological adjustment or uh, becoming uh, undergoing some sort of uh, skill or tests to uh, to make that transition so you're more aware of now what your new role is going to be. Uh, the last stage is incorporation where you're reincorporated as a different individual into a society. You have a new status. Um, let's talk about a particular rite of passage and that is uh, through the group the Mindy of Sierra Leone, West Africa. Uh, when a girl uh, experiences her first menstruation, uh, her first period, she's removed um, and excluded from society. She might be removed for a number of weeks or months, but while she's in seclusion during this separation and transitional phase, in her transitional phase, she is to discard the childhood clothes that she's familiar with. She is to uh, smear her body in white clay. Uh, what the smearing of the white clay is, it's to religious, religious, uh, religiously purify the body and by doing so you are wiping slate the clean, uh, the, 
the, you're giving yourself a clean slate, essentially. Um, when you are, after a certain time period of self-reflection and inclusion, you're also at the same time learning what it means to be a woman. Once you've uh, recognized then that you're no longer a child in the Mendy society, that you're now a woman who um, can have children and being a mother to teach children then the ways uh, and culture of the Mendy, you dress in a brief skirt and you have strands of beads, which is a symbolic uh, outfit that members of the Mendy society recognize as being a woman. So again, the three phases there are separation, transition, and incorporation. And with this religious ceremony, a woman in Mendy society undergoes a transition from child to woman and now is a functional member in that society and performs the duties of a woman in the Mende society. Uh, that example is how we are to end the religious uh, lecture. There are certainly more topics to be covered in your textbook. I would encourage you to read the chapter, take notes. We didn't cover everything in religion. Um, but we certainly have ethnographic um, videos that I want you to see, and uh, certainly uh, there's some reading, other reading assignments that, were, that correspond to this material. Uh, I find uh, religion to be a fascinating topic, and I encourage you to do your reading and be familiar with the terms that weren't covered in this lecture but are covered in your book. So. I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow when we talk about arts and its influence in culture and society. So tomorrow, lecture 14. All right, have a good day.